Well, uh, thank you so much, Igor Solutions, for your informative presentation, and I believe every one of us benefited out of it. Well, now we are coming to uh, commencement of our first uh, panel discussion, which will be uh, on um, which will be moderated by uh, Senior Council uh, Barnabas Yalosi. I happily invite you to the podium so that you can introduce your panelists and uh, the discussion uh, topic will be the future of the legal profession. Kindly, Karibu Sam. Good morning. Good morning. Ms. Leila Latif uh, should be joining us soon. I want to uh, introduce her to give her bye while she has joined us. Okay, now I'm told I can start with Kenneth while we are waiting for uh, Ms. Latif. Now, as I said, Kenneth was uh, with us from yesterday uh, and his bio, long bio, which is very heavy, was said from yesterday. Now my point of consideration for today's topic is that uh, Mr. Kenneth is, uh, represents Uganda at the Fourth Industrial Revolution portfolio communities of the Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution of the World Economic Forum. Now, I just concentrated on this part because he's going to talk about, uh, briefly, about the concepts of such as artificial intelligence, data protection, uh, in relation to intellectual property, and the legal practice, and the future of uh, the legal practice. Now, uh, this is, this is for all the, the, the panelists. I know you might have your, uh, your slides, but what I want to, uh, to tell you is that we'll, we'll be giving you 10 minutes to take us through, to give us a, a, an introduction of your, what you're going to, uh, to say, because we want, it, we want it to be more interactive today. Just 10 minutes to uh, pass through your 
what you are going to talk about. Um, so you give some sort of an opening remarks towards your your uh, your presentation, and uh, members will, uh, of the floor will, will, will discuss because you want it to be more interactive. I'm sure uh, the size will be shared later on. So just take us through with an uh, opening remarks, then uh, we'll give uh, the, uh, the members the, uh, the floor to discuss. Uh, also, uh, Ms. Ivon will be discussing on uh, sports law. Now, I think the theme of this uh, law on this year is specialization. We don't want uh, us to be jack of all trade, so specialization. Very interesting. Ms. Ivon has decided to go into sports law and it is paid, you'll hear later on. <laughs> so I humbly welcome Kenneth to take us through your opening statement, then uh, Ms. Ivon, by then I think Lela uh, will be with us, so Karibsa Kenneth. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're feeling good after yesterday's session. And as we take you through very interesting stuff this morning. So he concentrated on the fourth industrial revolution portfolio. And I think I will concentrate. I'm also the chair of the technology committee, technology media and telecoms committee of East Africa Society. And so one of our mandates is to be able to speak to lawyers at forums like this, for us to be able to understand what is the technology, uh, what is practice in tech, what is practice in intellectual property, what is practice in media and in telecoms, and of course I think that also covers areas like sports law that uh, my colleague here is going to speak about. So, ultimately, what does the future hold in store for legal practitioners in intellectual property? I think from the time that I started practicing, that was about maybe 12, 13 years ago, intellectual property at that time was mostly trademarks, copyright, patents, etc. But now we see, especially in the fourth industrial revolution, when we say fourth industrial revolution, what we mean are technologies like artificial intelligence, and I think Microsoft is a leader in that. You see, uh, areas like drone technology, you see areas like blockchain, you see areas like the Internet of Things. I can be able to break this down since the moderator mentioned that this will be an interactive session. So these I'll be able to speak about if there are any questions, if you want me to be able to delve into either uh, of those things. But when you look at technology as a whole, I think at the foundation of technology you have intellectual property. Because without protections to many of these technologies, it would not be possible to have innovation as much as we have it now. You must have a monopoly over certain products to allow you to be able to reap or take back the investment that you've put in your research and development team. And for many of these entities that are giving us all these tools, many of these entities are giving us all these solutions, that intellectual property is the way that they can continue to innovate and the way that they can continue to spur us on. And so ultimately, as a lawyer in this fourth industrial revolution, today I want to be able to break that down even further. I think whenever we, we speak about the 4 IR, either we speak about it in the abstract, or use terms that perhaps do not come uh, closer to what we interface with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so some of the areas that I was hoping to be able to bring to you, oh, actually, this is uh, an old presentation. I think there's uh, an updated one. So, 
Today I wanted to break that down even further. And some of the areas I wanted to speak to you about are some that perhaps some of you have heard of or some of you are yet to hear of. Perhaps today will be the first time that we shall be interfacing with some of these things. But they are relevant to you nonetheless. I think in many instances, many of us, not just lawyers, but just East Africans, or generally in this part of the world, we spend too much time on things that involve our societies, but we do not think about things that actually concern the world. For example, things like climate change. We talk about these things in the abstract, but we start to see the effects when you see uh, how many times it has rained in certain regions, how many times you have famine in many areas of the world. Now beyond that, you also have other advancements that have happened in things like space technology. How many of you have heard of what we call the James Webb Telescope? Ah, okay. Well, there are a couple of hearts here. That's good. So, for those of you that are interested, or not even interested, in that particular part of the world, or that particular part of the law, the James Webb Telescope, I'll just go to it quickly, yep, then I'll be able to go back. The James Webb Telescope is now the most expensive and the most, I don't, I don't know what, what words to use, but it has opened up a whole new world when it comes to space exploration and space technology. So what it has done is, this is a telescope that's I think about 1.2 million miles away from our orbit. That's about 1.6 million kilometers. And it's the largest and most powerful space telescope ever launched. Now, about 10 hours ago, that particular telescope captured the first clear evidence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of a planet outside of our solar system. Now, for many of us, we don't understand how important these things are, but what this telescope has shown us is that there are many, many galaxies outside of where we are. In the past, we didn't know that we had all these galaxies. Now, that is important, not just for the movies that we watch. I think, I'm not talking about Guardians of the Galaxy, no. I'm talking about real stuff. That's important. Because eventually, we are going to have space travel. Eventually, if they discover other planets and perhaps discover that these planets are habitable, and I think there's one which I had uh, got it for you guys. This is a planet called uh, TO 1700D. Did you know there's another planet that looks like Earth? I think we're told in the past that the Earth is the only habitable planet we have, either in our solar system or before, but there's another one which is the TO 1700 d planet. It even has just numbers for names. But this is important because eventually we shall have human beings set on this planet. Now what kind of law are they going to have? Or what kind of lawyers are going to be representing them or be able to discuss issues like human rights and you know, such things? And beyond that as well, that may, not, that may seem very far-fetched or far off for lawyers in East Africa. But as we all know, for many, of, many African countries get their laws from, like Tanzania and Uganda, Kenya, where do we get their laws from? Sorry? From common law. Now, they are the ones that set the agenda. Outside of perhaps, uh, in many instances, of course, some of them will try to incorporate uh, our culture and our customs into the laws that we have. And of course, now we have taken many of these back. But ultimately, the bedrock of our legal system is still foreign. Now, if we still leave that in the hands of other people, how will we be able to have a voice that's as big as these guys that are actually discovering all these planets and are naming them whatever they want to be named? So again, this is something I hope to be able to open your mind to lawyers that are in this room. Let's be interested in these things that are happening in the world. Let's be interested to find out exactly how or what areas of law are emerging and what areas of law you can also be able to take charge of and be able uh, to have a voice compared to the ones that we have been uh, practicing. And as I do that, I also got a very interesting statistic here. The labor tech market worldwide is, I think by 2021, was at 27.6 billion US dollars. Did you hear that? 27.6 billion US dollars. This is the legal tech market. Who is taking up a chunk of this work? Are there any lawyers in this room that are taking up a chunk of that work? I think these are questions again we should be asking ourselves if we're looking at emerging technologies and the future of practice. 
Where are you when you're looking at these figures? $27.6 billion. We've been talking about artificial intelligence. I'll try to bring this home. Artificial intelligence really mimics uh, human beings. And the speaker yesterday spoke about human cognition and the like. But one of the key things we look at when we're looking at artificial intelligence is what happens when a machine becomes self-aware. What happens when a, a machine has the same voice as me or as you? When it now has rights? When it says that I don't want to die? When it says that you're hurting me? Ultimately, these are questions again that may seem very abstract now. But we've seen from the presentations from yesterday that there's a certain point when women were not regarded as people. There's a certain point in our history when black people were not regarded as people. You know this. So if, let's think 30, 40, 50 years, 100 years down the line, these machines then become self-aware. And they're asking for these rights. And as at last year, there's a, a Google scientist that was fired because he claimed that one of their AIs had become self-aware. So this is something that's really happening. There are also various projects that are looking at transferring human consciousness from, of course, from a human being, either alive or someone in a coma, and into a computer, and into a machine. So there are many, many issues to be able to look at there. Are we playing God? Should we regulate such things? Should we bar them or stop them? Does that stay for all stop any development? Again, we are talking about other things and not concentrating on things that are actually looking at the advancement of our species. And if we don't have a voice in these things, as lawyers in Tanzania, in Kenya, in Uganda, in Africa, we will be disadvantaged when other people are regulating, when other people are innovating and moving forward with areas that are very, very dangerous. Okay. As I do that, we also have biotechnology. There's a technology, there's a, a, a development called CRISPR. Has any of you heard of CRISPR? Good. What this does is it allows you to edit genes. Anyone can be able to edit a gene. So if you want to have a baby, your couple that wants to have a baby and you want the baby to have a particular eye color, you want the, your baby to have a particular skin tone, you can be able to use such technology to be able to do so. Again, there are many, many questions that, that come up from that. Is that ethical? How do you regulate something like this? Should you stop any uh, any research into such technologies? If you allow it, what considerations should you be able to look at? And again, as well as in Tanzania, are these things you're looking at with the rest of the world moving forward while we're focusing on land law? These are questions we should be able to ask ourselves. I already spoke about that. Again, looking at space travel, there are companies, SpaceX, there are companies called Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin. These are companies that are now taking space travel for ordinary human beings, before it was only government scientists that were able to go out into the world. But these companies are now, you can pay them money and be able to be a space tourist. But who is regulating this company? What happens if they leave debris somewhere in space and somehow that debris finds its way in Tanzania? When you're having a drink on Cocoa Beach and then the cup just comes and falls on you from a quiz, that point to be like. Again, we look at these things in the abstract, but eventually, Eventually, these things are going to come full circle to Tanzanians and to East Africans as well. And so ultimately, this morning, since there's like just a, I think one minute left, I just wanted to just tickle your mind a little bit, to let you know that there are other areas of law, there are other areas of interest outside of what we know, but these areas, it's important to have more lawyers talk about these things, more lawyers practice these things, because we do not want to be left behind. And the risk of being left behind is something that is real. So if we're using these phones and using social media and using all these devices, do we understand the law that backs these things up? And as legal practitioners as well, there are many areas of practice that we can be able to look into that will expand your service offering. Technology has changed my life. My practice has changed as a result of embracing technology. And there's so much in there. The things to do with financial technology, and we've seen, we've seen a couple of companies that are already here uh, that, are, that, are, that are part of this uh, conference. Financial technology is very, very big in Tanzania at the moment. It's very big in Africa. But how many of you understand the nuances of this particular area of law, or this particular area of practice? These are all clients that you could be able to take up, and there are so many of them. 
and all these clients who are thirsty for lawyers that understand these areas of law, that understand uh, these, uh, these uh, areas of practice. As I of that, of course, we also have things like data protection and privacy, which is something that's very prevalent, in not only in East Africa or Africa, but in the rest of the world as well. And so I hope we should be able to talk about data protection, because I see the moderator is looking at me with a, a, a bad eye. But ultimately, as I said this morning, I just want to tickle you, to let you know that we should be finding out about these things. It shouldn't be only people they call the gigs in, in courts who should be looking up the, you know, the algorithms, who should be looking up the James Webb telescope and the like. No, these things concern all of us. And the moment that it comes full circle, it may be 10 years from now, maybe 15 years from now, maybe 30 years from now, but these things are already happening. And the truth is many of these things are so kept from us because of what we check out on social media. I don't know how many of you, this is the last thing that I'm going to uh, uh, speak about. There's a guy yesterday who was speaking about branding, and I think one of the things he spoke about is the use of social media. But if you know that if you spend almost all your time on social media, and if all you're doing on social media is looking through what your friends are posting about, you find that you will find yourself in a bubble, thinking that you, you know everything that is there to know, but when in essence you're just regurgitating whatever you and your friends or colleagues are doing. But when you expand and go outside of that, you start to see how many things we don't, we no, how many things are hidden from us. But hidden from us in plain sight, in the sense that if you actually took the initiative to be able to find out, it would be very easy for you to open your mind, it would be very easy for you to expand your practice. So this morning, my question to you is, are you ready for the future of law? And when I say the future of law, it is not in 10 years, it's not in 30 years, it is here because we are already practicing it. And if I am a colleague just like you, and these are the instructions that I am getting in 20 or 30 years, where are you going to be in your practice? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kenneth. And I think what uh, uh, Kenneth has just done here is really tickling us as he said, and I, I gave him two more minutes because of the change of slides and that's why I gave him two more minutes. I will not give him one more minute. <laughs> uh, Kenneth, what has Kenneth just said, what I've noted, is that we are here, we are already there in the fourth industrial revolution, we are already practicing it probably without knowing you're in social media you're practicing uh, fourth industrial revolution uh, later on on the Q&A and the discussion I don't want it to be more of Q&A uh, I think Kenneth will, he will cover on the difference now because I think this is more confusing for more, uh, many people the difference between I and digitalization you know most people confuse this digitalization in IA and most of us are already in digital because I, I don't know if uh, for those who are, uh, are litigators you know you, you can you file the case while you are in your office so we are already there and we are practicing it probably without knowing so in the Q&A I think you will cover that and some, some of the things are will, will tickle also later now, uh, with that being said, I wish to invite on board Ms. Ivan. Now, Ms. Ivan, as I said earlier, specializes in sports law, corporate and sports law. Uh, she's a, a managing, uh, managing founding partner at Queen. Did I pronounce it right? Queen in Law Chambers and she's the head of corporate and sports law and specializes on corporate and sports law. Uh, her role at Quidden is to advise both individuals, uh, uh, companies and sports agents on sports law. Um, she, or Quidden has 
clients like Juventus Oman. So you can see this. Let us give our, all our attention and see where legal practice can benefit from sports law. One of the things that Ms. Ivon is going to cover is what is the future of sports law in Tanzania and what are the opportunities and the challenges in sports law. Now, as a tickler, you know, you use the Kenneth words, Kenneth words as a, a tickler, I want Ms. Ivon not, not to start from here, but in your presentation or when you're taking us through your presentation, you tell us how do we get in in sports law? We see major deals in sports. Now there was a, 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 a I don't want to declare my interest here. You you just know if I'm young or simple, <laughs> but you know how major deals have gone through this couple of uh, months in sports. 400,000 major deals. How do we get through? Uh -huh. Why are people going with the, why is engineer Harris going with the, alone in the deal? Miss Ivan will tell us. Karim Sanaiwan. 10 minutes. Boxing 
commission that does that deals with only the boxing in Tanzania that is actually we have it has actually become one of the most fastest sports that is growing here in Tanzania but also we have the tennis swimming basketball I won't uh, mention all of them but so I will talk about the challenges and the opportunities that are in the sports law or sports industry. I'll start with the challenges. The first one is the knowledge gap. It's very unfortunate or it's, let's say we have, uh, it's very unfortunate that we do not have institutions that actually teach or give out courses or give out seminars about sports here in Tanzania. You have to actually take them from other universities or other colleges or other professionals that come out of the country here so that we could actually bridge this gap. And for instance, from East Africa, I think, I'm not so sure, but I think we have the Strathmore University in Kenya that teaches about sports. So you actually have to go to Kenya for the, for the uh, classes that you have to actually be there and the online classes. So this is, uh, very big gap here that we have to bridge it. But then we have a few experts in the sports industry. I can't say the statistics or I can't give out the number of people that have actually specialized in sports, but I don't believe there are a lot in our country. I believe there are a few of them. But then because of few experts in the sports industry, it's really hard for other people to actually come up and say, I am actually doing one, two, three, because we think there is no, uh, let's say, there is no business in it, or no one is going to listen to me, or no one is going to actually care about me. But I think with more experts in this industry, there are a lot of things we can cover. But also about the inadequate laws, we have adapted a lot of laws here in Tanzania, but then some laws don't actually relate to us. We have a lot of things right now that are happening and we are yet to, to, what, uh, we are yet to adapt them. For instance, the female athletes and it's, it's now a very sensitive subject to the other countries. We've seen um, female athletes actually protesting about their payments, protesting about um, versus maternity leaves and all this, but then what, uh, I mean, as Tanzania, what have we done to actually eradicate that kind of challenge? And uh, the opportunities around, of course, we have employment. Uh, with the growing sports industry, it's easy for us to get employment. I mean, if we get people that specialize in employment, then it's, I mean, specialize in sports, then obviously we're going to have a lot of people that are going to employ themselves or make their own businesses out of sports, not just as a sports lawyer, but also we have we have lawyers that are agents, we have lawyers that are the compliance people in the in the sports industry. But also um, the expansion of the business sectors. Because of the growing industry of sports, we have a lot of investors that are coming around in the country, they're coming to invest, we have all this Sports companies, you have Embed, Sports Pesa, all these people coming to invest right here because now, at least uh, I can say the sports industry is is uh, it's giving an eye opening to a lot of things. So, what is the future of sports law? future of sports law right now. Um, there, there is the development of sports law. I mean, the development of sports law makes us rethink the law. Because with the development, there are a lot of laws we're going to adapt. There are a lot of laws we're going to actually uh, make them now so that they can relate to our community or our country. For instance, um, we have the anti-doping laws. We do have anti-doping laws, but 
but actually they're not. Um, we still adapt from the WADA, the World Anti-Doping Anti -Doping Agency, but we're yet to make the Tanzania Anti-Doping Laws. Uh, we also have like uh, the Anti-Trust for the Competition Laws, the Intellectual Property Laws. The Mr. Kenneth actually spoke about intellectual property and how it can affect the sports world. We're yet to do that. We have things like the fantasy footballs or things like branding, things like the image rights, all this fall under intellectual property, but where do they fall when it comes to the sports people or when it comes to sports law? We also have the anti-discrimination laws that are actually very sensitive right now everywhere about the women athletes in the world. What has Tanzania done towards that and what is Tanzania going to do about that in the coming future? We also have, um, the second point is the embracing the digital world. Miss Leila actually uh, spoke about the NFTs yesterday and all this, and the world is moving to this side. We have the, the non-fungible tokens, we have the fantasy football and the online games. We as the Tanzan we as Tanzanians or we as the stakeholders into the sports industry, what are we trying to do about it and how are we going to adapt all these new development in technology that are happening in our country, in, in the world. And also we need uh, the future sports. So I, I believe in the next future, probably in a year or more, we're going to have more increase in the professional experts in sports. Like we will have people that can only deal with the sports injury law or only sports lawyers or people who are going to deal with the compliance and all that. What, uh, I mean, I believe in the future we're going to have more experts, but also the availability of the sports education institutions. We do have a sports college in Tanzania, it's called the Malia College, it's in Mwanza, but they're yet to teach about sports law and all this. So I think it's a great call for the government, it's a great call for the Tanzania Law Society, it's a great call for the universities and all this to actually start encouraging but also to actually um, what can I say uh, I'll speak sorry for this to actually let I mean or te start teaching this uh, sports I mean sports law into the curriculums in the universities in the, the colleges and all this so that we can bridge the gap. Thank you so much. I think um, Thank you. For any, I'm sorry for any questions. Thank you very much, Ivan. And in fact, you have spared us two minutes. That would be very useful in our, when we are taking up to a discussion. Now, um, she has vastly covered on sports, sports law regulations. In fact, um, when we were talking outside, I asked her about the trainings on sports law. I am aware that on, uh, on August last year, there was a training on sports law. The three-day training on sports law. And there was, uh, when you, you, you're done with the training, there was a, some kind of a registration to a professional, legal professionals dealing with sports registered with BMT and I don't know if you're aware of that or anyone is aware of that we'll, we'll discuss it later on. That when you are, you're done with the course, you're registered as arbitrators are, you're registered as these are the people, listed people dealing with sports law. Now, what I want you to take into the, uh, to go on pondering it while we are welcoming uh, Ms. Latif is how do we, and that is the major question, how do we penetrate in that business? Sorry to use that word, penetrate. <laughs> <laughs> how do we get in in sports, uh, as sports lawyers? How do we get in? How do we want now to, when Aziz Key is signing there, there's no only Engineer Harris there, but there is a lawyer for Engineer Harris. When Aziz Key gets into a problem with the younger, it's not. It's not given a. a, a uh, it's not given a lawyer by younger. No, 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 no. He finds a lawyer in Tanzania. How do we do that? I think we all remember the uh, Morrison saga. When 
the Morris and Saga came in, we, we, we saw the lawyers representing uh, Morrison. Well, we'll discuss it later on. The lawyers came from the other side of the, 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 the coin, representing Morris. Is that not conflicting? So we'll discuss it later on. Um, our last panelist, I don't know if uh, she has joined us, yeah, Miss Leila Latif. I know she was here yesterday as well, but um, and most of the uh, Bible was read today, I believe.
because of um, because we need to rush onto this presentation in order to make it to ten minutes, we already seen instances where people in the form of avatars are getting married on the metaverse. Now, are is that valid? Is that legal? Is it actually recognized in Tanzania or in Kenya or in any other African country? No. But is it recognized in the United States? In some states, absolutely yes, because we already have law firms that have um, established a virtual presence on the metaverse by buying virtual land, hosting their law firms on the metaverse platform and actually providing these services to avatars who actually want to get married. Now what happens at the point the, the owner of the avatar dies, right? And as part of his will, he doesn't leave behind access to his avatar as a token and maybe his avatar is part of a non-fungible token, an NFT, which has value and perhaps it's valued at maybe $20,000. Um, who has access to that meta, uh, to that avatar? Is it his avatar wife or is it part of his estate? And if it's not part of the will, is it then part of his intestate estate? So ladies and gentlemen, these are a number of issues that are arising as a result of the metaverse. And we need to start thinking about what are the legal implications? What do we have to face with as we go along this, uh, this new trends that are forming within the, uh, the digital space? Now, um, we also have instances of contract law, contract formation that's going to cause a lot of problems. If you're going to have clients, and this is going to happen because the youth are heavily invested and engaged in transitioning towards digital applications and also supporting the metaverse because they are launched on it, they're playing virtual reality games on it, right? So the question is, um, how do we address contract law matters? Can a valid offer be made on the Metaverse platform? And if a valid offer is made, how is communication in terms of acceptance to be communicated? What do we deem as consideration, right? In the event there's a breach of contract on the Metaverse, where does the cause of action arise? Whom do we sue? Where do we sue? Because the Metaverse is unregulated. It has a non-geographic premise, it relies on users with that have regard to nationality or citizenship, and there are no national borders, right? So the metaverse determines its own rules of play. Now, what do we do in instances of the same? There are other issues that arise with respect to property law. Now, this is fantastic. In 2021, an investment firm paid $4 million for 792 non fungible tokens on the Ethereum blockchain to own about 1,200 city blocks on the sandbox, right? So property law is a, is a core area of concern and courts are already setting precedent, especially in the law around NFTs. So we know that um, trading in cryptocurrencies in some countries is still not considered legal because it is not being regulated by the central banks. But in the event you have purchased or you've minted your own NFT and you observe that maybe somebody else has stolen your NFT or is using it without your authorization, do you really have a cause of action? And if you do, can the Tanzanian whose NFT is being utilized by somebody in um, Ukraine, how will you be able to address this cross-border jurisdictional issues, right? How do you even identify this person in terms of where this person is because the only access you have is access to their account where they have displayed your NFT. How do you sue such a person? Where do you take a claim for such an issue? So certain of these uh, cases have been addressed by the UK. There's a very prominent case, it's called the case of um, Lavinia Deborah Osborne versus Individuals Unknown and Ozone Network. You can access this online, there's fantastic jurisprudence that's coming out of the UK high courts on, on, on this particular issue, right? So um, here are some statistics. You've got a bunch of apes here that have been trading as NFTs and some of them have actually been sold for 24.4 million US dollars. And for me as a tax lawyer, my question comes in the sense of somebody is earning this income, right? But is this income subject to the payment of tax? Because if you look at, for example, the Kenyan Income Tax Act, 
it, it defines the tax base in a specific uh, you know, character. There are certain categories on which tax is supposed to be imposed, but do, do NFTs form part of the tax base? So does this mean for Africa, because we already in, you know, we already have problems of debt, and many countries are moving towards debt distress. And there's an argument that uh, at the international political forums that we need to be able to mobilize revenue domestically. So is this one form in which you know African countries can actually start taxing non-fungible tokens to be able to now tap into this sort of money, crazy money that is being, that is being floated around in terms of purchasing and selling of NFTs because it is a form of domestic resource mobilization. It does result in taxable income uh, for the government as well. So these are things that we need to think about moving forward. Now, when we look at the metaverse and again, focusing where the future of the legal profession is moving towards, there are going to be legal claims that come out of these platforms that are metaverse platforms where people are engaging and legal issues are arising. The most common example that has been given is the one from Roblox. Now, this is a specific gaming platform. It's one of the biggest apps. We've got 42 million people who play Roblox daily. So this particular game, it kind of lets you build games that you can then explore. You've got to start by registering an account, you have to create your avatar, and you also have to create your sort of a digital e-wallet through which you purchase the Roblox currency. Now in this particular case, what happened is that somebody purchased an avatar, and then they purchased, you know, like um, regalia for the avatar. So sunglasses, a skirt, shoes, red colored jacket, etc. And you've got to pay this, um, for this regalia to be able to dress up your avatar. Now what happened is three months later, this avatar that was wearing the red jacket, for example, the red jacket was deleted by Roblox. But payment had been made for the red jacket. Why was it deleted? What was the cause of action? These are the issues that are cropping out in courts in terms of litigation. So the question is, are we prepared? Are our laws, um, um, do our laws recognize the extent of such violations when it comes to contract formation? And if not, what should we be doing? Now, um, this is the issue of avatars that I've already touched on when I was explaining the fact that the people getting married on the metaverse and they're taking it in the form of avatars, right? So that's how legal relationships on the metaverse are formed. You've got to be able to transact through an avatar. Now, the question is, um, um, what happens when you use an avatar created by someone else, right? How does our law currently deal with violations of intellectual property? Is this a violation? What happens when there is sexual assault with avatars? There's a lot of cases such as this that have been happening in, in, in the Republic of India, whereby avatars have been used as simulation for sexual harassment. And some of these cases are in court, but then there is a, there is a gap in legislation, there is a gap in jurisprudence, and we have to wait and see what the Indian courts are you know, churning out in terms of uh, jurisprudence uh, over this aspect of avatars and how we deal with them. So the, for me, the issue here is that our legal system, it places personal identity at the center of legal transactions. Now in the metaverse, the starting point is a digital identity. Now in our legal system, contracts are concluded between persons and the physical human interaction is required. Of course, you know, digitalization has changed some of this, but in the metaverse, the reasoning is different. And the importance of personal identity becomes secondary. People can perfectly act as anonymous avatars in the metaverse. And this is accepted on the basis that the blockchain technology on which the metaverse runs will digitally characterize all possible transactions so that they can be reconstructed at any time, anywhere, and they can ultimately be assigned to a physical person. Our legal system is not adapted to this virtual reality. So there is a number of red flags that arises because of this, and most specifically is the problem of illicit financial flows and criminals using the metaverse platform to engage in money laundering activities. Right? So I don't have to say much about this, because the main issue is that money laundering 
functions around you know secrecy and clouds of anonymity and the metaverse is actually providing them the platform that they need to be able to now um, move or transition money laundering off informal markets onto the dark web of which metaverse becomes a big part of right so the question here is if we're supposed to adopt many countries have already implemented the financial action task force, task force recommendations which require all countries to adopt anti-money laundering laws but part of anti-money laundering laws means that you have to know your customer that if your customer is an avatar do you really then know who your customer is so do lawyers who are engaging with clients who are avatars are they negligent or are they unconsciously promoting an enabling environment for money laundering to thrive? These are questions that we need to think about and then put it to you to actually reflect on as well. So there are tax considerations, right? When it comes to metaverse, I already gave an example of how NFTs should result in uh, taxable income. But then the question is metaverse transactions generate real world revenue which is in the form of cryptocurrency so two questions for you can transactions in the metaverse actually be taxed where metaverse transactions are undertaken by avatars who then should be taxed suppose the avatar is trading or is, is based in the united states but the person has residency in the united kingdom does it cause jurisdictional conflicts who should be taxed should it be samson's virtual presence in the metaverse for example that is subject to tax on the sale of virtual products or Samsung's headquarters itself. Again, if Kenyana based KPMG's virtual office in the metaverse is engaged by a virtual advisory client, who should be taxed? Could it be KPMG's virtual office in the metaverse or its retail office in Kenya? So, ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the questions and red flags that are in store for us in terms of deciding where do we want our profession to transition towards and how do we want to adopt our skill sets and, uh, and update our skill sets so that we're able to actively engage in the metaverse and provide good legal services. So um, just a few tips or pointers on what we can do as we think about legal reform in order to transition our practice onto the metaverse. Um, what the United States lawyers are doing, and even some Singapore-based um, law firms are, you know, engaging in currently, is creating your own law non-fungible tokens, right? So you create your own NFT. It's very easy to mine this. Okay, you don't require a lot of computer science knowledge. All you need to do is go on OpenSea and create, um, or mint what we call not create mint NFTs. Set a price and auction them on OpenSea. This is a platform where NFTs are bought and sold. And then the people who want to purchase your NFTs alert them that your NFTs are redeemable against, for example, one hour legal service on issues related to the metaverse transactions. This is a start, right? It may not net in revenue for you this year or next year, but trust me, five, ten years from now, it's going to be a big market. Again, to attract new clients, and to increase profitability and keep up with evolving trends, um, purchase land in the metaverse. Sandbox is one of those uh, platforms where law firms have begun to, to buy land, virtual land. Open your offices and host trainings and meetings on it. This is where you attract a broader client base that's not only limited to Tanzania or Kenya. So in 2022, um, the US law firm of Arab Fox it's a law firm that deals with personal injury cases. They have set up their metaverse offices. They've actually bought land, paid a lot of money for it, but they've done that. In 2021, that was the first law firm, again, a US-based law firm, Google Colorado. Um, they actually are the ones organizing metaverse marriages and advising clients with trademark disputes. So the field uh, for legal engagement in the metaverse is fantastic, it's phenomenal. It's open and it's, uh, it's, there's so many possibilities. And I think with this, I'm just going to stop. I think, I hope I have been within 10 minutes. So open to your questions and further discussions on the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for a, a very nice presentation. And I know time was a bit tricky for you. Um, now, 
ladies and gentlemen, we are now tickled. I believe uh, this, the 10 minutes, maybe the organizers will give us more five minutes for, for the discussion, depending on how you interact. But I believe there will be many, many questions of the three presenters. Now, uh, to start with where Leila ended, for example, how do you tax BNB? BNB, how do you tax it? You have booked BNB, you have paid BNB, eh? withholding tax, tax, tax. <laughs> Now, there was a discussion in East African Law Society by the last weekend, last week on, on uh, taxation of uh, digital uh, platforms. There was that discussion I attended, I think. Yeah. You were there? Yeah. So, how do we tax these digital platforms? How do we tax these, these things? Withholding tax, 15%. Uh, 15% of the non residents for, for residents is 5%. Huh? Okay, now how do we do that? Now, um, with Leila, maybe I will, I will start with the questions and then I will welcome the members of the floor. With Leila, what is the status of the position of uh, the legislation in, in Kenya on data protection and the digital technology? What is the position? And um, with Kenneth, with iPhone, my question is just that, how do we penetrate into the sports law business? How do we do that? I know TFF has a platform for intermediaries, and most of the intermediaries are not lawyers, and they do, their, they do our work. They'll come ask you, and they, they go play as lawyers. Now, how do we get in there? And with, sorry, with Kenneth, with Kenneth, uh, the difference between AI and digitalization, then how far has Uganda gone along with the fourth industrial revolution, digitalization, and AI, and the inclusion of uh, or coverage of digitalization and data protection in East Africa generally, because I know you have covered that. So, with that being said, I welcome questions from, yeah, I see more questions. We'll start with the lady and the gentleman there, and then I'll carry on. Thank you. Uh, I have a question to Miss. Excuse me, sorry. We'll take three questions, then they will respond. Then three questions, they respond. So, Thank you. Uh, so, to, I have a question to Ms. Arvon regarding challenges in sports law. Uh, from my experience, I have experience with sports law only once, and the biggest challenge for me is uh, was sort of a conflict between, let's say, traditional law and uh, I may call it soft law of sports organizations. For example, if you have a sports like a football player, for example, in my country, uh, he is considered a normal employee of the sports club with all his employment rights, like he may resign any time, he may just file a notice and uh, leave uh, the club without any payment and uh, without any consequences. But we have also his sports contract, we have a uh, discipline status, let's say, of FIFA, and we face something which is called transfer payment. And we understand that this guy cannot just leave uh, his club and join Man City, for example, without any payment and without any consequences. And this is contradictory to traditional law, but still we have to respect this soft law of sports federation because uh, in the end it has more leverage. So do you experience these challenges in your practice and how you do it?
Where are we with the GDPR compliance uh, for Tanzania and East Africa? And uh, regarding to NFTs, uh, how, how does the patenting work uh, in the metaverse or uh, the NFT world?
or you're trading your goods and services on the metaverse and you are earning through uh, the use of your NFTs or basically you provided a legal service on the metaverse or any service that you provide on the metaverse and you receive payment in non-cash form. You receive payment, for example, when you have had your avatar pick up in real value, then the question is, that real value that your avatar has picked up, is it subject to capital gains tax? Because there's been an increase. Your avatar was valued at maybe um, $100, but now it's valued at maybe $300. That's extra. Should that extra be taxed? So these are the discussions that we are having around the tax uh, implications around NFTs. Um, it's still in the pipeline, um, so I cannot give you a definitive answer as to what really would be uh, the tax implications, but these things are currently being traded on. I can share um, information with the organizers so that they can share with the rest of you if you want to know more about NFTs, what they mean, how they work, how they function, and how you can also meet them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kenneth? Um, the first question was around well, the difference, the similarity, if any, between artificial intelligence and digitalization, if I got that correctly. And so, as I mentioned to you, artificial intelligence is really machine learning. Digitalization is really timing, uh, perhaps I would say, uh, documents or really anything that I'm giving it an electronic uh, personality or forming electronic records. So I would say artificial intelligence is a tool for digitalization. And uh, definitely, since uh, we're still speaking about the topic, there are many issues that arise as a result of using artificial intelligence, there are many issues that arise as a result of digitalization. And I think the biggest one which uh, touches Tanzania as well is, I'm aware Tanzania has a law on electronic transactions, I think you have an electronic transactions act, so does Kenya, so does Uganda. I think many countries in the world are now giving legal effect to electronic documents. And so as I mentioned to you before, from the discussion we had, is if you have artificial intelligence and it creates these documents, does artificial intelligence own it? Does a person who has coded the machine or the AI that is getting these documents own it? Beyond that, you also have many issues around data protection and privacy because artificial intelligence utilizes a lot of data sets to be able to learn. And so there are many issues around privacy, there are many issues around ownership of this data, and also around intellectual property uh, that uh, these AI applications uh, may be able to come into contact with either trademark work or with copyrighted work, and uh, so on and so forth. And then um, the second question I was asked was, Uganda in the fourth industrial revolution, how far? I think we're really moving forward. One, from the legal perspective, we have passed a number of laws in the fourth industrial revolution space. Uh, if you're looking at one, under financial technologies, we have a National Payment Systems Act, which regulates the use of mobile money or electronic money. I'm not sure if Tanzania has a law. Uh, well, uh, very good. I know Kenya does definitely have a law around payments as well. Beyond that, for drones uh, in particular, I think we have guidelines. We don't have a specific standalone law that uh, looks at that, but there are guidelines for use of drones in Uganda. And then, of course, you have laws like the Computer Misuse Act, which is actually undergoing an amendment. And uh, you have other laws like the Data Protection and Privacy Act. So we do have many laws. I think the challenge is having more Ugandans utilize these technologies, so having more lawyers as well understand the legal issues that would arise as a result of utilizing these technologies. Um, and then there was a question around, around data protection in East Africa. Okay, so I, from uh, Leila's, uh, from, the, from, from what Leila mentioned, definitely Kenya has a data protection law, Uganda has one, Tanzania doesn't have one yet, Rwanda does not have one yet, although they have, uh, uh, they have clauses within, uh, I've forgotten the law that they have, but they don't have a clear standard of law. So outside of that, as you're aware, many of our countries are subscribers to the African Union Convention on Data Protection and Cyber Security, on personal data protection and, and uh, cyber security. But that particular convention or treaty is yet to be nationalized by many jurisdictions, including Tanzania. But so 
we still have a bit to do when it comes to data protection and privacy. And I think if I now segue to the question asked about the GDPR, the GDPR is a general data protection regulation which covers Europe. And although there are many clauses there, since we have many Europeans that still operate in East Africa, and you also have many East African companies that interface with data that belongs to or that identifies Europeans, then that coverage of the GDPR or the scope may be extended to East Africa. But ultimately, we are sovereign nations, and so we must have our own standalone laws. And so if you're looking at the operationalization of the GDPR, I would say the biggest issue around that is around transport data, the cross-border transport data. Uh, for those of you that uh, are interested in data protection, is what we call standard contractual clauses. These allow companies or entities to be able to transfer data to countries outside of, of, uh, of, of where the data subject is. So if you're transferring data, for example, outside of Uganda, which has a data protection act, and which restricts any transfer of data to any country that does not look at data protection in the same way or in the same, with the same strength, so to speak, that Uganda does, then there are penalties for that. And so it's important as well if operating in this global climate, in this global environment, to ensure that all countries are, are equipped or understand the implications of not having these laws. Because if somebody is transferring data from Uganda to Tanzania, there are issues that may arise as, as a result of Tanzania not having a data protection law. So there's what we call standard contractual clauses. These have been made popular by the GDPR or in, uh, in uh, Europe, but this can also be used for companies that are trying to transfer data outside of countries that have laws to countries that do not have laws. And I think, uh, I think this is a question that was asked later, but uh, I'll still just uh, talk about it briefly, about patenting NFTs. And if you're looking at intellectual property, I would say NFTs, you'd be looking at copyright in particular, perhaps also trademarks as well. This is how you're looking at intellectual property in the digital space. Patents, I wouldn't uh, say NFTs would have any patent uh, laws that would be able to cover them, but copyright and trademarks, and as such, definitely, there are cases now where, there's, where you have intellectual property infringement for use of NFTs. At the moment, the biggest cause of action would be a property right, which is copyright, that someone has infringed on your NFT, someone is using your NFT for the purpose for which you did not intend to use them. And then of course, if they also register trademarks as well, the issues around passing off the names for the NFTs. And some of these NFTs are not only popular in the actual NFT itself, but the name that the creator has given to it. Some of these names are very unique, and as such have trademark protection that uh, covers them. So I think, I think those were the questions that I was asked. Yeah, sure. Now I want uh, more of your experience, How do we get in sports lawyers? So, I would explain this in my experience. Uh, when I wanted to venture into sports, the first thing I did was, of course, attend some seminars and uh, apply to some colleges and took some online classes. But on top of it all, that's not enough. I did some pro bono works for some agencies for some players, they brought in their contracts and everything. So with it, I got to learn how these contracts are here in Tanzania. How do they work? How does the business go? So that was uh, of great help to me. But also, I think we need uh, to use social media as well because right now the world is uh, looking through social media. Through social media, you get to know a lot of things. And through writing the articles, through posting some videos, through uh, webinars and all this, it's a way that we can learn, but if it's a way as you as a sports lawyer or you as someone that wants to specialize into something to actually, I mean, people to actually get to know you or understand what you do, and eventually they can bring in work to you. But also, um, another question, I hope I answered you. Another question was my experience uh, between the soft law and the traditional law here in Tanzania. I think it's still a challenge here as well. And we still have miles to cover it. 
we still have a long way to go to actually get there and um, I think because of uh, right now we have big big leagues and we have these big clubs that are working I think it's going to start in the leagues so that we could actually make the soft law and the traditional law to what to not clash so yeah it's still a challenge and the last question was about the image rights the image rights are still uh, protected under the copyrights act here in tanzania but then it's still a challenge because a lot of the athletes or a lot of players don't actually know about image rights what they know is i'm going to play for a certain team or certain league all I need to do is just sign the papers and I'm done without knowing that between the clauses and within the contract there are clauses about image rights so they get to sign off their image rights without them knowing but it is within us to actually give out information or give out the knowledge to these players as the lawyers but also it's within us to actually tell these players that do not sign before you actually um, engage a lawyer to actually help you out with this. I know players and athletes believe that lawyers are expensive, but not really. I believe that uh, there are lawyers out there, me uh, included, <laughs> will actually look at the contract before I even tell you I'm going to charge you maybe some amount. I will look into it and see how I can help you because I believe if I help one person, then 10 more will come in. Okay, uh, can I talk to myself? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, sure. I like what she said about uh, uh, for image rights, many of these players sign over their rights without them knowing. There are a number of cases that have come out of Uganda around image rights. One of them is called Vinia Seke versus Opportunity Bank. I think which was one of the first cases, what the first case in Uganda that really enforced image rights and also saw a very huge award. And so for those of you that are into uh, dispute resolution around that, that's a, definitely a good case. There's another recent case that just came out of our high court, it was against Roofings, I can share this if anyone wants it, against uh, Roofings Uganda. And so in that particular case, actually talking about that, the court uh, held that you don't have to have express consent in order to be able to sign away your rights, especially in your image. That consent can also be implied, especially if you know, for example, you're shooting an advert, and that advert is, you, you, it is implied that you are aware that your image is going to be used for commercial purposes. And so you do not need to have an express contract where you're giving away that particular right, but if you take steps within, as, as we know, oral contracts are also allowed, and I think they're also allowed in Tanzania. So those are two cases that I felt you, know, you should be able to know. So if around image rights, we're looking at the right to publicity and the right to be let alone as well, which is the right to privacy, which we've been uh, speaking about as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Now, I think for, uh, because we, uh, we are very limited in time, and there are other panels as well, uh, that will be all for the, uh, the floor. But the panelists are there. You, we can interact later on. And on image rights, maybe to add up on image rights, yes, copyright, you can cover it under copyright, but it doesn't expressly talk about image rights. Now, there is a case in Tanzania also, I don't know if it went to appeal, the De Gracias Yun Marando. If you've ever heard of this, by Liambina, Marando was, uh, the great, I'll share with you, the Gracias Yun Marando, where he was granted 50 million. I don't know if it went to appeal. His image was used by a security company without his consent. So he, he secured, he, took, uh, he filed it in district court, they appealed it to the High Court and the High Court granted the orders uh, granted by the District Court. So I think we can, we can uh, access this. Maybe uh, if you may allow me two minutes, there is someone who wants to contribute and I don't think if this should be left alone. Yes, one minute please. I hope it's not a question, it's a contribution, no? My name is Simon Plenty. Uh, I wanted to contribute a little bit to the image rights. Uh, under FIFA, we have a president that guides us 
which says when a, a fan is wearing a jersey of a sports team, you don't own that image. So with confidence, I can post you, or I can use your image with our jersey for commercial purpose, and there's no way, nothing you can do against that. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you so much. But, but uh, way back when David Beckham was playing in Indonesia, his image was used in the condoms, and they were written, score like Beckham. <laughs> that is, there's a trademark case on that. And David Beckham sued successful. So I think it's an area that we need to look, look into. And uh, Sunday, know that he's very good in that, and he knows that case, I think. So guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this very interactive uh, panel. And Leila, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Ivan, sorry, I started with the ladies. Ivan, thank you very much. And Kenneth, it was very, uh, very uh, good for, for the knowledge that we, we gained. Thank you very much, and please approach to the...